So, uh, so we're going to uh, we're going to talk about a a bonding curve setup. So uh, probably a lot of you know what a bonding curve is, but but I'm gonna kind of introduce it anyway. So if you were uh, if you're building a crypto economic system like like Golem would be our exa one example that we've mentioned before, then uh, what you might decide to do is uh, for uh, for payments in your network to either use something generic like ETH. Or you might want to use your own native token, and uh, you know there are different uh, there are different reasons why you would or would not to, to do that. I think one good reason you might want to do that, um, and I quite like this uh, this kind of way of thinking, is that uh, your native token allows the price of your token to be correlated to what's going on in, in your network if if needed, and that and that kind of feedback loop could be very very useful for your system if you're using ETH and there's something going on in your network. It's extremely unlikely that the price of ether is going to evolve somehow correlated to what's going on in your network, and that's something you might want. Um, with your native token, you're still not guaranteed because what we what we see a lot is that there might be a lot of speculation around your token, and still the movement of your price might be more around the speculation rather than what's going on in the network. But at least that way, you you give it a chance that what's going on in the network actually is. Um, reflected in the price. And so if you do use your own native token, you need some way of creating it and some way of getting it into the hands of the users. And why one way of doing that is to use a bonding curve. And what a bonding curve is, is this smart contract that sits, uh, that sits on the blockchain. And at any point in time, any user can either buy your native token from it or sell your native token to it. And what this bonding curve specifies, this, this one is, is quadratic, is what, uh, what the price of the token is at any given point in time. So on the y-axis, we have the price of the token. And on the x-axis, we have the number of tokens in circulation. So you can see that it's just the price of the token is just a function of the number of tokens in circulation. And it increases quadratically. So, uh, so if we do some simple math, then we can see that uh, if you want to buy a volume V of tokens, then um, it's going to increase quadratically with the number of tokens in circulation. So, so thanks to that, we we might have this kind of useful useful behavior that well, first of all, the more tokens there are in circulation, the the higher the price, right? So that would give some sort of a soft limit on the number of tokens in circulation. But also, if you imagine this kind of scenario where um, where your users, some of your users are kind of very devoted to the project, and some uh, aren't aren't as uh, involved, and maybe those who aren't as involved want to exit the system, then what will happen is that those people would uh, maybe choose to sell their token, which means that we would go down the, go down the bonding curve. And, and then what will happen is that the number of tokens of circulation will be lower, and it will be just enough for those really devoted users to kind of, uh, for the system to get stable again at this, at this lower price. So that's kind of a nice, uh, nice feature of this, of this bonding curve. Um, and from okay, and from our point of view, this whole setup is just is just another part of our system design, right? So this is another hyperparameter that potentially we might want to want to tune because that's definitely going to uh, affect uh, the the resultant behavior of, of our users. So uh, so that's why we want to we want to do some uh, some work of designing this thing. Um, so now uh, before we go into the experiment, it would be great to. Uh, to kind of hear your thoughts on what you think would be things to consider. And we can kind of, again, divide them into those three groups. So hyperparameters, what do you think the important hyperparameters would be? So the things that kind of define our system and, uh, and our, are in our control, so we get to decide them. Then there are parameters which are out of our control, and those are the things that define what happens in the system after it's been launched. And then we have some assumptions about what it is that our users uh, might care about. So uh, yeah, so if you if you have some ideas for any for any of these that we might want to consider, then uh, yeah, feel free to suggest something. Okay, do we have the do we have the mic or not? Oh, okay. The maximum number of token one agent can acquire or buy at any time or in total. Okay, yeah, that could be that could be useful. Um, yeah, so that would that would go into our hyperparameters, right? Because that's something we can specify. 
initially. Um, you could have a spread between buy and sell, spread between the buy and sell price, um, so not just a, um, a single curve. Oh, okay, interesting, interesting. So we would, so we could have a, uh, yes, yeah, a, a separate, a separate bonding curve for selling. Okay. Um, interesting. And that, and that would be for, for, for kind of the system to accumulate uh, money. Or? Um, well, it's 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 used uh, it's used by a few projects also to um, to reduce uh, shorting because there's a cost, and so mm -hmm. depending on how wide the spread is, mm -hmm. so it can be used for um, for capital accumulation, but it can also be used as a as a disincentive to shorting. Okay, interesting. Yeah, for different agents, you might want to assume a short and a long, uh, you know, intention to participate in, mm -hmm. you know, this economy, would say. And additionally, you might want to choose, you know, initial capital available yeah. for both the short and the long. Exactly. So like a budget constraint for, for every agent. Yeah, that would go. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure. mm -hmm. yeah, something like the stickiness of tokens, so availability. Maybe some other use cases in the system, so uh -huh. that they they are there, but they are not available. Um, I'm not sure if I. So, I for example, you can use a token to buy things. So people start okay. saving it, mm -hmm. and so they mm -hmm. were there, but they are not available for others who want to buy tokens. So mm -hmm. this would enhance Got market it. price. For Got example. it. Yeah. Yeah. So you could say that people might have some like private utility for those tokens yeah. just to hold it, or maybe they can buy another asset. Which yeah, which would be an extra mechanism. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so I think we've we covered some hyperparameters and assumptions. And what about some parameters? So what about some things that we observe over the system and are uh, out of our control? I think we haven't. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the token price is probably uh, one of the most important ones here. Um, I guess it's still something I was thinking about in terms of. Equilibrium is that if if you have you know let's say a whale or um, yeah if you if you had an individual whale or if you had agents that were uh, you know acting as a consortium, then one equilibrium at the ending is that yeah there's a massive majority whatever like eighty percent or something mm -hmm. of the tokens end up in one buying group or controlling group however you want to call that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so maybe you want to define like separate groups of users and then. Uh, and then observe how like skewed the distribution uh, of the token is, right? And mm -hmm. and you'd rather have it more uniform than. Uh, it could be because to put it into a concrete example, uh, you mentioned you know news or you know, let's say forecasting on news. So mm -hmm. it could be in the interest of a group to come in and simply own that market, mm -hmm. and, and then they're able to uh, you know have an overwhelming influence, which is against you know the mechanism of that ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. I, I think that one parameter is, of course, uh, the actual value of the network. So how uh, the activity within the network. Mm -hmm. And also, um, because of course, uh, let's say in a prediction market, activity also depends on, on the question to bet on and how, how relevant this is for the total um, number of contributors or agents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's an that's an interesting point, and something something to add here is that um, when we when we think about the total uh, value of the network, that is very likely to um, to scale with what we assume the budget of the users is, but also to scale with what we assume the users' utility, like you mentioned, of the of the token is, right? Because and that's again something where the hyperparameter will heavily affect the outcome, right? If we assume that all users have high private utility for the tokens, then obviously they would be more likely to, to buy them in the first place and then more possibly more likely to hold them and so on. So, so, so when we talk about the total value of the network, we must remember that there will be some hyperparameters which would just just in, increase that. So, we, so there we should probably talk about like trends rather than um, absolute values of, of uh, hyperparameters that affect them. Yeah, and uh, one one last thought. I'm not sure exactly how you would encode this, but as a, you know, an an unknown outcome, we haven't talked about the environment. You know, that the most of these uh, things that we're talking about are for Ethereum blockchain. So, 
if we have, I don't know, whatever the next CryptoKitties is, you know, you can have mm -hmm. too much noise in the environment for people to participate. If there is, you know, some kind of epoch that could disrupt um, people mm -hmm. being able to participate. And additionally, if we were to think about a golem, you know, maybe it, it simply is too expensive to do what they want to do. You know, maybe yeah. for live peer, it's simply too expensive to do video encoding in such a network. And instead, I don't know, they have their little video encoder in a box that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that they have at home or something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like a, a bonding curve, as we said, is just a mechanism for for distributing tokens. So it would never really live on its own, but it would be kind of a backbone of some um, some network that does something. Like a, a a golem could could use it, or some some other system that that uses that native token. So, like you said, there would be always stuff kind of on top of it. Right. I was just wondering, in terms of like stabilizing a token, and we've seen a lot of problems in the past, is there any way in a system that you could have an underwriting for a token? So you're at a certain price that you've got a, it, it's more going back to supply and demand. And actually what underwriters do is staking for a token and making sure the price does not tank or people are just not manipulating mm -hmm. the price. Yeah, so, so that could be like an extra, uh, extra mechanism that we that we introduce kind of along our our bonding curve, for example, and we could. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, and then I'm I've got gray hair and I'm ancient and I've got wrinkles, so I'm going to ask you a question now that I've been dying and I haven't had the answer from anybody. Um, why do you use a bonding curve? What what's happened to supply and demand? I mean, if you're starting to have a bid and offer on a bonding curve, well, that sounds to me like it's supply and demand. So how does that play? Sorry, I had to ask. Someone. You see what I'm saying? I mean, um, you're talking I'm, about a bottom price for a, a supply and a demand curve. I mean, that's supply and demand. It's not a bonding curve anymore, is it? If you're able to mint or not mint, like more tokens for that, then what is it? Um, if you're able to mint, but you have to have an incentive. So your incentive is the price, which is a factor of demand and supply, right? Um, okay. Yain. <laughs> what? Uh, yain. So ye yes and no. Yeah, I know. Okay. So I'm, still, I'm still having a problem with that, and I think it's a thing. Can I think you repeat the question again? Yeah. Uh, the, well, the, the question really is, we're talking about bonding curves, and there we've just talked about a bonding curve that has a bottom and it has a top, so it basically has a supply and a demand. And so I'm asking, why does the crypto world insist on calling these things bonding curve and just not go back to supply and demand? Because when you make a market, you're... It's supply and demand, isn't it? And you guys want to make a market, so I don't just, understand the bonding uh, curve. Just Sorry, one more question. That what, be another, what, what, it is an automated market maker. I agree, but then you have to be able to show supply. You have to have a, a bid and an offer, don't you? Uh, well, what what it, what this tries to do is to do is to not have to have market makers. So you're actually bidding and offering to the contract, not rather than to a counterparty. So, so the it's contract is autonomous, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like how I like to think about it is that, okay, I, let's say, I want to create something on the blockchain and I want people to um, be able to buy and sell the token from me, right? And then I'm going to specify, all right, I've come up with this way of saying that depending on this, on the number of tokens in circulation, that's the price I'm going to pick, right? And that's kind of my my design and now we want to kind of evaluate evaluate that design but that's that's all, all this does is is like specifies some mechanism of like yeah distributing the token like you said like market making so um yeah i'm not sure if there's any like philosophy but yeah okay we maybe we can um yeah Um, how do you put uh, the risk preferences into into the system? Because obviously it's a system where you can buy in very cheap in the beginning, and um, that's that means there could be a hype. Yeah, people run into this asset or this, into this token. But as soon as it starts declining, the risk preferences decides if there is something like a run on the token, and everyone tries to be the first that gets out and not the last. So this is this yeah associated with the risk preferences. So, so risk preferences in general, like they're they're very important for many projects. Like for instance, when you're talking about insurance, right? Because insurance is kind of run by our risk prefer preferences. So one easy kind of way to encode it would be to say that uh, most agents would always prefer to incur a small 
a continuous cost in small chunks rather than be exposed to a risk of the one big big hit even if in the former case their expected their uh, their expectation of their of their uh, output is uh, is lower lower um so so that's one way to encode it right but but yeah but you could also there are other aspects from like uh, behavioral economics for example like the, that people are uh, are actually more um, that you care more about losses than they do about than they do about winnings, right? That you that there's more uh, emotional uh, response connected with losing one hundred dollars than uh, winning one hundred twenty dollars, actually, because we're we're more kind of wired wired that way. So, and all these things would be part of of the of the kind of objective function. So, in in your case, the agent m might have some of their own idea of what the like utility of the token is and it's and it would be uh, and it could also like change its um change its idea for um for the value of the token based on what's happening as well right and that's something we might see at the like at the very very end so so yeah so it's all kind of baked into the objective function yeah um yeah, so I think we've uh, we've pretty much covered this. Like this, uh, your 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 ideas were way more detailed than this than this simulation is going to, is going to be. Uh, not all these things have been have been covered. So, the simulation setup is is the following. Um, I call the native token the asset token, and then the the token that kind of everyone has is like like ETH is the reference token. So, um, um, so asset token is the one that you that you buy from the um, from the bonding curve smart contract using the reference token uh, to enter the system and uh, yeah we would use some we would define some budget constraints for for the agents and we also define objectives for the agents and in this uh, uh, simulation the objective will be uh, fairly simple is for the agents to make as much money as possible in 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 the long run so so that's that's what the agents care about they're kind of greedy in that sense and, and the possible actions, again, is very simple. Agents can do nothing or can uh, buy from the contract or can sell to the contract. Two, uh, and, and that, that, those were the components that they would use to build up their strategy that would optimize their, for their objective function, which is to make as much money as possible. In some scenarios, what you can do is to use heuristics-based agents. So those are the agents whose, whose actions are actually defined by some simple rules. So something like price goes up, uh, sell, price goes down, buy. And those are sometimes useful to kind of create the sort of background for the simulation. But, uh, but in most cases, kind of the, the most important part is, is the machine learning-based agents. And, and those would be like the, the key part of, of each simulation. So those are the actual the agents who observe the environment, observe the possible actions, and given their budget constraints, they come up with a strategy that maximizes their objectives. So allows them to make as much money as possible in the long run. And in terms of the simulation output, so the parameters that we observe and that we care about, yeah, like you said, that would be the, the evolution of the price that's, that feels like it's very important. And that would also include the price volatility, right? So something that we might want to look at. And and we might also care about kind of agent strategies. So the great thing about, about using this software is that you can actually um, kind of look inside uh, inside agents' heads uh, uh, and and really understand the the decisions that that they were that they were making and and see the kind of motivation behind particular decisions. So these are the these are the graphs that we're going to be looking at, and this is the the evolution of the of the price of the token, right? So on the y-axis we have the price, on the x-axis we have time, and uh, and this is the evolution of the price. So so again, not to be confused with the with the bonding curve, uh, the bonding curve just specifies. Um, the rules of how you interact with the uh, with the bonding curve smart contract, and this is what actually happened in the in the simulation. And we uh, and I marked here some like interesting uh, events. So, for instance, here, Agent Eighteen bought uh, 100, uh, 100 asset tokens here very early on, and this is this is a like relatively high volume. And then what we observe is that Agent Eighteen uh, sold seventy here, bought fifty here, sold sixty here, sold sixty here. And each time Agent 18 pretty much did something, it was it was a high volume transaction which which caused a large move in the in the price of the of the token. So so what we observe first of all is that early on we can see the price going up 
and then reaching this level of roughly 50,000. And again, this level of, uh, uh, this level of roughly 50,000 would be kind of the, ki the kind of average um, approximation of average like utility agents have for, for this token. But when, when this level is reached, uh, there's quite a bit of oscillation going on around it. And that's because uh, we have this one agent who has quite a bit of power to move the price up and down on the market. So that, that kind of tells us something about the initial distribution of the token being quite uh, quite skewed, which which means that there is like one party or one agent that has a lot of power in the market. And then a different example is here, where we we have agents who um, we have several agents who early on bought smaller amounts, and and what we see is that the overall behavior is similar. So again, the price reaches roughly the same point and oscillates there, but the oscillations are much smaller because there is no kind of one entity that has a lot of power in the market to move the price up and down. Um, okay, so now we're going to look at some of particular agent strategies to, um, to be able to understand the particular decisions made by uh, the agents. So we're going to take an example of, of uh, first of all, this agent 18 who bought 100 tokens here and decided to hold them up until this point and at this point sold 70. So, this is what's, what describes the kind of thinking process of the agent. So we can see that at timestamp 101, um, these are the top three actions that the agent uh, considered, these three. And these are the approximate kind of scores that the agent uh, associated with them. And we can see the highest score was, was associated with this one, which it chose. Uh, but what we also see is the like, subsequent uh, action that the agent kind of was planning to follow up, to follow this one uh, to follow up with this one. So it's not to say that the agent necessarily would, would choose that action on the next occasion, uh, because in the meantime, you know, the environment changes, they might, might, change, might uh, choose something else. But at this point in time, on time step one, one, that sort of strategy seemed the best for the agent. And we can see that it indeed chose to sell 70. But the second best strategy, as we can see, was actually to buy five more, so not to exit anymore, and presumably hope that some other agents will, will follow and some more agents will buy in, the price will go further up and then you go and sell uh, almost, almost all your tokens, so even more than here. And, uh, and that strategy like, seemed to be almost as good as, as the one with, with selling immediately. So, so here, a bit more risky, hoping a bit that the price would go up a bit more. Um, <clears throat> and now, now, as another example, we will look at <clears throat> this agent uh, 16 who bought 40 tokens here and, and uh, held them all the way until timestamp roughly 200 and only at that point decided to sell them. And we're, we're going to be able to see how the agent like, made decisions along the way to finally decide to sell them here. So at timestamp uh, time 7, so very early on when the price was uh, 36,000, so pretty low, we can see that the agent like, didn't really like, consider selling like, very seriously. We can see that those two, a those two actions uh, dominate. Um, and have much higher score, although the agent does, does potentially consider selling uh, later, later on. However, when it, when it comes to time step 86 and the price is now 48,000, uh, we can see that now the decision is much, um, much uh, closer, so the agent is much less confident and the scores are uh, close, but it, he does decide to, um, to buy one more token, which is essentially to wait and only sell afterwards. But the second best action is to start selling already and then sell even more later on, uh, but, the score, but the score is slightly lower. Uh, but then even later on, where the price got as high as 55,000, then eventually the top action was to sell 40, and the agent was, well, uh, fairly confident that that's the, that's the best uh, action to take. Um, yeah, so the, so the key findings um, from, from this simulation were that uh, what we've observed is the, the asset token price would, uh, across kind of all scenarios, go up to this level of around 50,000 and, and kind of stay there er, and oscillate around that level. Um, but the amount of the amplitude of oscillation seemed to be dependent on how, um, how uneven the initial distribution of the token is. So if, um, if the volatility of the price is, that, is something that you care about as the system designer, then you might want to uh, introduce some measures into your system that make sure that it's like difficult or impossible for, for 
particular agents to get a lot of uh, tokens for themselves. For example, by introducing um, a, a limit on how many, how many tokens you can buy early on, a, a single agent. Okay, so that's, that's it for this uh, case study. And if there are any questions before we go to the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for these simulations, um, each time step meant that every agent had the opportunity to make one, one choice, and that, that was always fair, correct? As in every agent, every time step got to choose to do one thing. So, so the, the actual specifics of how the setup kind of vary, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it to have like sample agents uh, run, run randomly on different time steps. So, so, so different, different ways to do it, but, uh, but kind of in long run on a long enough, long enough horizon that shouldn't make, make a huge, huge difference how that happens. Yeah. Uh, just wondering, uh, have you compared your key findings uh, to any uh, you know, publicly available data? Um, so for, for this particular case, um, no, not really. So I don't think we have, um, yeah, I, yeah, I should probably look into that, like cases where bonding curves were actually, were actually deployed and, and how that was done. I know that a lot of teams do uh, spend a lot of time kind of planning uh, the distribution of their tokens. So, for example, to avoid situations like that. But yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, the agents have a concept of, or how did you model the concept of low price, high price for the agents? Do they have an absolute scale to compare to, or do they only uh, compare to their previous actions? What may or mm -hmm. may not be a high price? Yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a good question. So, if you um, so essentially, if you're an agent, then you want to kind of choose uh, actions that like make you money, right? So, but but it is true that you can use different like reference points. So you can either say that um, you start off, um, so like I start off where I am right now, and whatever money I make from now on is gonna make me happy. But yeah, but another way to look at it, which is potentially another like of these non-rationality behaviors is that maybe where I am right now is also important, right? Because maybe I got, you know, um, like pe what people say on about about moving prices, right? How I got here also make it, makes a difference, right? And this is another like behavioral economics thing, right? Where, so this is something that can be also incorporated in the, in the objective function is that if I got where I am um, by things getting better, then, then my approach would be different if I got here by things getting worse. Right. 